everyone. Welcome to our fourth episode of Seen It First, sponsored by Fictionary, your story editing software. In this series, we sit down with award-winning best-selling authors to talk about first scenes, explore writing craft, and celebrate the stories that thrill and inspire us all. I'm James Gallagher, a Fictionary certified story coach editor and a copy editor. And tonight, I am very excited to welcome author Marshall J. Moore, author of the Rites of Resurrection series, which includes The Pale City. And a little later in the program, we're going to take a good look at the first scene from The Pale City. There's action, there's intrigue, there are animated dead warriors. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this is a 30-minute recorded session, and with a little luck, we'll have some time for questions at the end, but feel free to pop questions into the chat at any time. Marshall J. Moore is a writer and martial artist who was born and raised in Kwajalein. I hope I've got Quajalein. that wrong. Hard, Jay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I knew I was going to botch that. Sorry. Uh, a tiny Pacific island. He has trained a professional mercenary in unarmed combat, sold $1,000 worth of teapots to Jackie Chan, and was once tracked down by a bounty hunter for owing $300 in overdue fees to the Los Angeles Public Library. An active member of SFWA, uh, Marshall's work has been published by the Escape Artists Podcast Network, Air and Nothingness Press, Mysterion, and many others. His short story, Red Lanterns, won second place in the 2022 Bane Fantasy Award uh, Adventure Award. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife, Megan, and their two cats. Marshall, thank you so much for being here today. How are you this evening? I am great. Thank you for having me. Well, there's a lot of uh, writing stuff I want to get into, but first, uh, because like most people, I love Jackie Chan, so I have to ask, what's the story with Jackie Chan and the teapots? Yeah, so that's a good one. Um, so my the first year out of college, I uh, moved to Los Angeles to do the starving actor thing. Um, mostly starving, not a lot of acting, it only lasted a year, but my day job during that time was a tea seller at Tivana, which is a since-defunct uh luxury tea cellar um and the particular location i was at um, was very close to the beverly hills area very close to the airport as well so it was not uncommon that we would get large groups of uh, foreign nationals coming in so when one evening a about a dozen chinese men came in all speaking mandarin to each other uh and it was nobody else in the store just them me and my boss i didn't really think anything of it um, so I'm going around, there's like one guy who's like, you know, acting as the spokesperson slash translator for the rest of his friends. Um, and so I'm like giving them, you know, the usual pitch and showing them all the equipment and the tea making devices and whatnot. And I'm literally like this far away and like midway through my very rehearsed sales pitch when I realized that's Jackie Chan. <laughs> He's like super dressed down. He's wearing uh, like lensless glasses and like a purple tracksuit, like completely not, you know, very avoiding the paparazzi kind of dress. But like I stutter in my speech and he just like goes, just sees the recognition done. And so like I somehow managed to recover from that. And he bought just a ton of uh, merchandise from us. Um very uh very cool he didn't really talk to us directly he was mostly just chatting with his friends um but he was like exactly as physical in real life as he is on screen like it was really cool to see him like touching everything and picking it up and i was like he's gonna start juggling these with like you know kung fu skills in any second now um so i'm not very easily starstruck but that was something special yeah that's that's incredible are you a, yeah. a big fan of hong kong cinema yeah i am yeah i like a lot of wuxia and classic high wire stuff yeah uh, Hard Boiled is one of my all-time favorite movies. Mm -hmm. But the um, the other thing in your bio is that you trained a professional mercenary in unarmed combat, which is interesting because of the combat that takes place in the Pale City. So I wanted to ask how your knowledge in that area helps you craft uh, some of the great action scenes. <laughs> uh so like a lot of uh writers that part of the bio is true but sounds better on paper than real life um by day i am a muay thai coach that is thai boxing the uh, traditional martial art of thailand um it's one of the most popular striking sports in the world um, anytime you watch a mixed martial arts fight basically all the stuff they do before they get on the ground is muay thai or muay thai derived um so i teach that in my day job and one of my former students uh 
extremely interesting woman um around she had basically a midlife crisis where she'd uh she had like a very stable white collar job and just decided one day she wanted to be a professional private military contractor so her day for like three years was she would like wake up at like four or five in the morning uh go to the shooting range for a few hours go to her day job then come to my gym and train in hand to hand and then go home um and she's she's been all over the world since she is uh i think last i checked like uh in a leadership role in one of the um private military contracting companies out there um i know she's been in south sudan um i think she was actually in afghanistan at the time of the withdrawal last year like one of the sweetest nicest people you've ever met it's one of the most fascinating people i've met in my life um very cool person <laughs> Anyway, but how that relates to the fight scenes that I write. Sorry, I got a little tangent there. Um, so, like I said, um, I've never, caveat, she's the mercenary, not me. I've never been in a combat situation. I just teach people how to fight in a sport nature. Um, but I find that the experience of sparring and being in a live drill situation does give you a estimation of, you know, what it's like to have the adrenaline racing and how to write fights in a way where the impression of the fight is what matters more than the individual action. I think a lot of writers when they're writing fights get bogged down in the minutia of like, and then I parry in this way and then I block this way and then I throw this thrust and that, you know, I've done probably collectively hundreds of hours of sparring and I can't tell you like in the 30 second rest between rounds, like what individual moves I did. I just remember the sensation and the impressions and all writing is about the emotions at heart and about what the character is experiencing and feeling rather than a, you know, break down blow by blow matrix speed style, you know, cinematic depiction of the fight. So that's basically my takeaway from having, you know, actually sparred and competed is that's what a fight scene needs to be is about the emotions of the character rather than the play by play. Yeah, that's a really fantastic insight. Um, and the uh, the last thing I was going to say about your bio was that, uh, you know, $300 is nothing to sneeze at, but the uh, LA library system is uh, doesn't play around. Huh? They really don't. Uh, yeah. That That's another one of those, um, my my brief but infamous time in Los Angeles. I had a, uh, I was moving and I had a, actually a CD, not even a book, which is super embarrassing for me as a writer, uh, a CD checked out from the Los Angeles library system. And, uh, you know, I was moving and I just didn't have time to return it, stop by the library and return it before I went back to the East Coast. And so I asked my roommates I was living with at the time if they would. And, you know, they said, yeah, sure they did. Uh, fast forward like six months later, and I got a call from a woman identifying herself as a uh, debt collector, aka bounty hunter, uh, inquiring after the overdue fees that I owe the Los Angeles library. <laughs> uh, she was super nice about it, which is, you know, a relief. But uh, yeah, you you think that once it reaches the point where it's more than the CDs worth, they just stop. <laughs> right, right. That's that's very funny. Yeah. Um, now, since we're going to be um, looking at the first scene of the Pale City in just a bit, uh, I thought you might want to set the stage for us and give us a little rundown of the world you created and the, the story you follow in those uh, three books, just to cue us up there. Yes, absolutely. So the Pale City and its sequels are a secondary world fantasy. Um, they take place in a city called Albastine, which is sort of vaguely modeled on the roman republic again it's secondary worlds so there's no real relation to our real world, world or history but that sort of sets the stage for the type of culture and the level of sort of uh, sociological and technological development in this society uh all of every citizen is repurposed into an undead servant when they die you die, your body gets resurrected as essentially a zombie, and they put him to work doing all the menial labor that doesn't require mental skill or acuity. Um, and this is mandatory, you can't opt out of it. Given that a city populated largely by the undead is not going to have a very sterling reputation, they are very much feared and hated by all their neighbors. And they're also a very small society. They basically live in 
one small valley up in the mountains. It's basically medieval uh, necromancer Switzerland. Uh, <clears throat> however, they're very good at defending themselves because if your army is largely composed of the undead, uh, it's very easy to replenish your troops after every battle. Um, there are sort of some Asimov style three laws implicit in the creation of these attendants, as they're called, um, which is that they can't harm the living unless specifically ordered to by a legate, which are these sort of soldier priests almost who are in charge of creating and ordering them into battle. Our hero, Cassius, is one of these legates. However, before the start of the novel, he has been injured in a recent battle against the barbarians on their borders. Uh, and this injury prevents him from using the rights, which is the magical system that allows him to control and manipulate the attendants uh, according to his will as if they were puppets, because there is a very uh, physical component to the said rights. So we open on him uh, still very freshly injured, still in recovery and searching for purpose in his life after this career ending injury. Yeah. And um, one of the things I wanted to say is that with all of the you know, like you said, your your magical system and the world you've created. Um, I think your world building is really sharp because mm. it's easy for a writer, you know, to get bogged down in too many details too soon in info dumping, you know, and you do a great job job of showing, you know, just enough to impart the sense of the world and tease out a lot of those telling details as you move the reader through the story. So um, for all the writers here, and especially those working in fantasy and building out their worlds, um, what is your approach to, to world building? That's an excellent question, and um, thank you for calling that out, because that's it's something I really enjoy personally, and something I took a lot of pride in with this series especially. Uh, my golden rule is only give the audience the information that they need in the present moment. Um, readers are smart, and they're going to be able to infer a lot from a little it's like even um just with like you know the like i said this book is sort of a quasi roman republic setting again secondary world not a whole lot of relation to our real world um but just the fact that i am invoking those familiar tropes and archetypes of the characters all have roman sounding names which i really regret because ending every male character's name in u.s gets really repetitive <laughs> after a while um it evokes a certain atmosphere and touches on things that you already have associations with in your brain. Um, so I don't need to, you know, go into super elaborate depth on, oh, but how does this, um, poli the politics of a, you know, antiquity era republic work? If you know anything about Roman history, like even just from pop culture, then that, that'll be enough to give you enough to just go on. Because um, the world building always has to be in service to the story. Uh, so golden rule, less is more. Yeah, that's a, that's another great insight because, and it's I think it's reassuring too because um, I think of, uh, with any kind of even though this is second world sort of quasi historical in a sense, um, it's really daunting a lot of times for writers to think something outside of their experiences. You know, they're very very fearful of getting that right. So um, you know, using just those those sort of telling details and. Um, less is more. That's that's fantastic. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to get at before we open up uh, the first scene in Fictionary is that it's very popular now to mash up genres, and those crossovers, because we're always trying for a new spin or a new twist. And the advice is always do the same thing for comps, but different to make it, you know, stand out as a selling point. So, um, you know, you always want to retain those essential genre elements. Um, but in in Pale City, you have what starts uh, in many ways as, as as a mystery and builds into something that's uh, something like social conspiracy. And you even have um, kind of elements of courtroom drama toward the end. So when when you're when you're constructing that, do you think consciously about the traditional beats for those genres, or are you just you know, following the story that grows in your mind? Are you a plotter? How do you how do you develop your story in that way? Uh, a little of column A and a little of column B. Um, I'm definitely a plotter. Uh, 
I usually start when I'm writing, um, this goes more for short stories than novels, but um, in the case of the story specifically as well, I started with um, either the end or a scene near the end and build back from there um, because I find it very useful to know where I'm getting to. I think one of the issues with um, pantsing, as they call it, uh, just making it up as you go, is that it's very easy to get lost. And I find it a lot more difficult to get lost if you have a map with you. Um, that said, as far as genre conventions and stuff, I think that stuff just sort of flows naturally from knowing the kind of story you're looking to tell. And I think genre hybridization, as you point out, is very prevalent these days, which is good because I think it's Steinbeck said that there's only like seven story archetypes and everything is just finding your own variations on those. Um, the originality comes in you and what experiences you bring to that story and how you tell it rather than the story itself um and that probably goes double for within the confines of a specific genre which i think is why we're seeing these genre mashups um the way i like to market this book when people ask me about it or ask me about the genre specifically is i tell them that it is high fantasy wearing an urban fantasy trench coat um, because it is, you know, secondary world and there are like epic fights and zombie battles and stuff. But also, like you said, it's at its heart, it's a murder mystery that it unveils itself to really be a political conspiracy thriller. Um, and I think that the more we get to sort of push the boundaries of where the borders between those genres are, the more you wind up with interesting stories that breathe life into both halves of whatever it is you're smushing together. And another thing with the the mystery element is a lot of mysteries are essentially develop as a series of interviews as the the detective in this case Cassius um, um, follows the the the, the threads that are going to open up the his understanding of what's happening, uh, and it's always a challenge to have those scenes that can you know become very. Re repetitive if if the author uh isn't careful and you do a, a a great job with that as well so what's your what's your approach to doing uh you know sort of scene by scene mm -hmm. to have those uh interviews and make them you know make the story still build and draw the reader along so um a big part of it is setting for one thing um i have them take so these interviews i have them take place in a you know decaying decrepit old manor where you know the guy he's interviewing is even older and more decayed than the manor is um i have them take place in a gladiatorial coliseum where the next generation of legates is being trained by his old mentor with whom he has a very confrontational relationship it it's all about place um, and another important thing there is if you're writing from a speculative element um keeping that speculative element in the forefront the inciting incident of the book and something he uses several times through the course of the investigation is because he's a necromancer, um, he can view the memories of a corpse. And so like that opens up a new avenue for me to keep it. Okay, he doesn't have to interrogate this person. He just has to see what they saw when they were still alive. Um, the other thing I think, uh, aside from keeping the speculative element foremost in mind and varying the setting is who he is interviewing and what it is they want and what is the nature of that relationship. Um, are they an, a, an antagonist who is trying to sway him to their side? Are they a nominal ally with whom he has a controversial or a adversarial relationship? There are all kinds of relationships and all kinds of textures that that can give the interview as well as tones. Um, the other important thing I think is, and this is more plot related than uh, scene by scene, is that each one of these has to unveil some kind of clue without giving away the whole thing, which is, you know, part and parcel of the mystery genre as a whole. Um, but each one points him in a different direction, but slowly, you know, is another piece of the puzzle bringing the entire thing together. I think uh, Shane is going to bring up that first scene in Fictionary, um, but I did want to say two things uh, as we do that, that the the magical system, you did some really cool things with that, and I don't want to give it away because it's it happens very late in the book, but there's very there's something very cool that happens with the magical system late in the book, and um, I also wanted to say uh, with the 
uh, with the setting that particularly that training area with the uh, waterfall coming through the training area is such a cool cinematic um, visual that you can almost it's almost like something I, I, I imagine from like one of the Lord of the Rings movies where that grand scale and it's really it's really fantastic. Thank um, you. Uh, any, any comparison Lord of the Rings is the highest of praise. So I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> and this is uh, this is fictionary. Fictionary is essentially a, a, a story editing software that provides a framework for self-editing. It is a framework for developmental editors uh, where you can load your, your story into Fictionary and track what's happening in the story across 38 story elements that are divided up by character, plot, and setting. Um, you not only have uh, all those elements on the page, but you can draw uh, their visual insights you can get where you can see a visual of the the if the whole um, manuscript were loaded here you could bring up a visual of the of the uh, story arc where you'd see the inciting incident and the plot points um if um uh, you know if the if this full story were here you could jump around uh between scenes what we have is the the first three scenes here are our first three guests on our podcast on our uh, presentations here yeah uh, but the thing that really uh, I wanted to talk about first in your scene here is that opening line because it's so important to provide a, a good hook and an early hook and I think this line is it's a little bit deceptively simple in that it's it's just seven words but it does a lot and it is fantastic and it raises a lot of questions so um i wanted to get your thoughts on that and also ask when that line came to you because sometimes people the 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 opening line is the seed for the story and it's the line comes first and and sometimes that that comes later so how did that come about and what are what are your thoughts on that uh thank you so this is um I believe okay this was the fourth manuscript that i wrote uh, the previous three all died on submission uh traditional publishing sending them out to agents um but i learned a lot from those experiences and you know one of the first things you get drilled into when you are doing the submission grind is you need to have a strong hook so i knew i had to catch the attention with the first line and this came about as me figuring out the most uh concise way to communicate to the reader that this character is a necromancer he is going to spend the entire series controlling zombies here you go yeah it's fantastic and, and one one thing one thing i love about the the dead is many of them wear those brass masks mm -hmm. and there's something very 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 creepy to have the the sort of unliving mask ahead of in, in front of an unliving uh uh face so that's that's a fantastic uh, little detail. Like I said, I really am very proud of the world building I did for this. Um, if you have a society where most of the manual labor is done by zombies to the point where you don't even think about the undead who are sweeping your floors and taking out your trash, uh, it's important that you further dehuman dehumanize them. Um, and the route they came by to do that is just to equip them all with these serenely smiling, very creepy bronze masks which, you know, works well for the genre because I want them to be subtly menacing. Um, but, you know, from a societal standpoint is like, no, they're not terrifying. They're just smiling at you. <laughs> um, because also, you know, if your uh, if your relative is one of the dead, uh, you don't want them doing, you know, mopping your floor or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, it, um, I'm really proud of that. It ties in very well with the broader themes of the story. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 fantastic. And when um, you know the opening scene is so important, the first scene, and uh, it's important for the for the novel that uh, you know you'll, you'll 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 see reflections of it at, at the end of the story, throughout the story, and it's also in a in a series um, even more important. It has to in a sense have even even further reach. So, oh, this is our this is our our word map. So you see some of the words that that jump out at you um, mm -hmm. just in the in the thing. But uh, so, what what were you trying to accomplish most in the first scene here? 
Um, so I think the most important thing for the first scene is it's the first time your reader is going to meet your main character. And if the reader doesn't care about the main character, they're not going to care about the book and they're going to stop reading. Um, so it's important to, I think, first and foremost, establish what the emotional stakes for your protagonist are. Um, here we see Cassius trying and failing to achieve something that he previously was very good at. The fact that it is puppeting a pair of zombies is neither here nor there. Everyone has at some point struggled at something that they were they thought they were good at. And so that is immediately a relatable situation that you can empathize with. Um, and then we find out, you know, it's because of an injury and that, you know, deepens that sympathy because clearly he is struggling with external forces that are affecting his internal character. Yeah, and you and you do it. You do a fantastic job throughout the scene. Also, there's with uh, Quintus. Um, there's a, there's a, a hint of something that's happened there, but uh, you let that play out, and 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 the reveal later in the story is also fantastic. So uh, all around, I hope everybody um, that hasn't read this yet um, is intrigued, and and if you haven't, pick it up. Uh, it's a great read, and. Uh, Shane, do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, pop them in the chat, raise your hand, the usual. But Marshall, I know I, I'd love to hear your uh, influences. Who are your who are your favorite influences? Uh, I mean, we've got all the classics, obviously. Um, I've I do a yearly uh, Tolkien reread. Um, I was raised on Narnia as a kid. Uh, Neil Gaiman is one of my favorites I discovered as a younger adult. Um, George R. R. Martin, although I'm, you know, still a little salty about the fact that we're probably never getting the last books. <laughs> um, late, where, where are the books? Yeah. Somewhere in his brain. Um, <laughs> more recently, uh, oh, and um, Jim Butcher's Dresden Files is a huge influence on this series in particular. Um, a lot of the full first-person detect fantasy detective point of view comes directly from those. Um, Let's see, more lately, I've been reading, um, I've been catching up on my Ursula K. Le Guin. I read the Ursi series as a teen, um, but I've been getting a little wider into her uh, Hainish Cycle, the Dispossessed, Left Hand of Darkness, and her other sci-fi stuff. Um, Tamsin Murr's Locked Tomb series, it, for anyone who hasn't read it, is one of the weirdest but most fun reads that I've ever experienced. Uh, and also heavily features necromancers. Uh, and it's just really like, Talk about intricate world building, plotting, and sharp, distinct characterization. She has got it. Uh, so that's Gideon the Ninth and its sequels, and they are fantastic. Uh, what else have I been reading lately? There's, there's a lot. I've read forty two books this year already. Um, yes. I'm voracious. Well, and you always, you always, you always see the advice. We read widely, read outside of your genre. Yes, read as much as you can. Bring everything you can from that. Yeah, the bar my, uh, steel, but current outside genre reads is um, "Legends of the Samurai" by Hiroaki Sato, which is, despite its title, a nonfiction collection of historic samurai stories. Um, and I'm actually working on a samurai novel right now, so it's technically oh, cool. not outside my genre in that regard. But uh, nice. nonfiction is not my usual bag, so I try and always have something in there. That is awesome. Okay, uh, Penny, you have a question. Hi, I was Hi. curious. Decided to choose your point of view, like first person, third person, and how that affected how you wrote your story. That is an awesome question. Thank you. Um, so I think that, that is obviously one of the earliest questions you have to ask yourself as a writer um, because it's going to affect everything. Um, the clo the tighter the point of view, the tighter your readers interaction with your character is going to be um but depending on the tone of the story you might want a little more distance or not um i decided pretty early on that for the pale city and its sequels that i wanted it all to be from a close uh first person you know first person past tense um because that's very much in line with the urban fantasy and more specifically the tradition of 
detective noir stories. You know, we, we've all got the hard-boiled Humphrey Bogart voice in our head whenever we think of that genre. And for me, at least, it would have been um, wildly out of character for the genre for me to write a story that was in like, you know, third person present tense or something like that. Um, and also, I think by getting into that voice, um, out of all the characters I've written, he's probably got a the closest to my my personal voice. Um but it still allowed me to get a little more into his head and to ruminate a bit more on how the events of the story were affecting him. Yeah, thank you for that. My um, my next book, which comes out next month, is uh, third perspective, third person perspective by contrast. What's what's the title of of that? Uh, that one is called Son of a Sailor, a cozy pirate tale. It is part of the cozy fantasy subgenre. It is about a pirate captain who uh, goes home to the tiny island hometown where no one knows he's a pirate. Uh, and he has not been in a long time. So as he is reconnecting with his family and friends, he uh, starts to reflect on the fact that maybe life at home isn't so bad. And then everything is thrown for a loop when his crew shows up unexpectedly. <laughs> nice. uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed writing it. Well, we are at the top of our half hour. So, uh, Marshall, I want to thank you so much for being here. That was a fantastic interview, and you you gave us a lot of uh, great insights on your writing process and on writing fantasy. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, you can come back uh, next month. We have Deborah Halverson to talk to us about YA fiction. Uh, uh, the month after that, we have Mary San Giovanni, who's going to talk to us about writing in the Alien franchise. So that'll be a lot of fun. And I want to thank you all very much again and see you soon. Also check out all the other events on the Fictionary calendar. A lot of, a lot of great stuff to, to take in. So thank you, Marshall. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you for having me.